Page 15, Hepatitis C Linkage to Care Projects. Mr. Martin, this time the Senate has a proposal. Yes, the Senate approved funding for the HCV linkage to and retention and care demonstration projects, uh, 462,000 for state operations and 1.7 million for local assistance. It's a total of $2.2 million general fund. Very good. So the Senate took its action mindful that only about half of those who are identified with HCV actually receive any appropriate follow-up care. And this funding proposal then would provide increased linkage, as you mentioned, to services for those folks. Ms. Bosler? Yes, uh, this is this is a, in a category with many of the augmentations here that are not part of our core uh, program uh, that the state delivers, the Medi-Cal program. This is an additional public health program. Um, we would note that the counties um, have a, a network of um, public health nurses um, and, and other individuals that work on various public health issues, including infectious disease such as hepatitis C. Um, also, uh, the Office of AIDS um, um, receives uh, received an ongoing augmentation last year, and many of the activities in, in that office also are towards um, reducing and preventing uh, the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, so we, we just don't support additional augmentations that the, the state can't support over the long run. Um, um, so we support the assembly version. In light of the enormous cost, we know the state is at risk of expending in dealing with new infections. Might $2.2 million be great preventive medicine? A very uh, point well taken. <laughs> Hepatitis C is, is certainly the, the cost of the drugs is something that we've really been struggling with. And also, it's, it's just a tip of the iceberg as more and more of these uh, uh, tailored drugs, uh, blood factor drugs, things that are very expensive to produce uh, and that are new to the market. So they have their own pricing um, um, issues uh, in addition. Uh, those continue to be a concern for the state. We're going to actually continue our high cost drug work group where we look at at all of the different factors, including prevention, um, at our um, high cost drug work group that we had this year, that we convened this year, we did have public health at the table, and there was a lot of discussion about how prevention um, could uh, uh, reduce the overall costs um, to the state. So this is a complicated, uh, um, a complicated issue, uh, made more complicated with how uh, the federal government funds health care. Uh, one of the things that we're currently doing is we put forward a waiver to the federal government to do more innovative delivery methods to reduce overall costs um, of health care. Uh, but uh, it's difficult uh, for the state to step forward and fund um, health care programs where there isn't a federal match. Uh, and that's uh, what this kind of program is um, outside of the Medi-Cal program. But again, I think you correct me on my numbers, but in the January budget, you had 275 million set aside to deal with this infection specifically and dropped it down to a little over 200 million in the May revision. So we're already planning on a couple hundred million dollars in expenses to deal with the treatment. This would be 1% of that 200 million directed toward a demonstration project that would get information to those who may experience the virus but aren't a part of the established care system right now. It could also link people who are at risk or already positive with new care options and provide services for the most vulnerable to stay in care. So it 1% of 200 million if I'm a betting man, that's pretty good odds that we're going to get somewhere with it. But you're, you're still resistant. Yes, and I mean, this is—I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that we're looking at in our waiver program—is really on how to reduce overall health care costs by doing more um, wraparound care, prevention, keeping people on their uh, prescribed uh, pharmaceuticals. Sometimes, um, you know. There is many reasons why people go off of them, and, and a treatment like this where you need to, to finish the course. I and mean, I think one of the, the big uh, reasons why the new drug is um, going is touted as so um, uh, 
life-saving is because it does end hepatitis C and also it's a much shorter duration of uh, the, the patients having to take the drug so there's more people likely to finish the treatment. So these are all things um, uh, that we do look at and uh, are concerned about. I think it's really just how the system of healthcare is funded. Uh, this is outside of the main Medi-Cal program, and so there isn't the full federal participation. We would like more participation by the federal government in prevention activities. I think they absolutely can lower the costs of and bend the cost curve is how we all talk about it a lot in the, in the healthcare world. Um, but this is uh, creating new general fund programs outside um, um, of our main programs that are entitlement programs that we are required um, to fund uh, is, is just something that we're not interested in doing at this time. I hear you. So uh, the $200 million you've already budgeted for treatment is clearly going to be ongoing, if not ongoing, and increasing. Mr. Martin, do we know enough about this proposed demonstration project to know that with a one-time $2.2 million investment, we could begin to gather enough information to determine whether it's effective or not, or would it take multiple years for a demonstration project like this to provide us any information that we could determine to be beneficial? Well, based on our understanding that this demonstration project would be based on um, models that have been um, for the HIV, and so they're copied those types of models to do outreach for the hepatitis C virus. Um, that isn't to say that it would be exactly the same. And we're know. dealing with different populations. And we're this dealing is with very ethnic based. Yes, although there there are a significant number of people with HIV who also have That's hepatitis C. Of, of, of course. Um, I don't for this demonstration product. I don't have an estimate of any potential savings in the future in any other programs. There's just, I don't have enough information about how this would be structured uh, in order to do that. So, uh, but one that being said, if you do prevent cases of HCV, and this would be outreach to people who are the most at risk, as I understand it, and then try to link them with care. So potentially you'd have screening of these people earlier on, and you might catch the hepatitis C virus earlier, you could potentially prevent costs that you might incur later if hepatitis C became, um, more, it, it developed in a more serious phase of the disease. Is there any more information that you could gather with regard to the proposed demonstration project that could better inform us as to whether Certainly. We could get some value out of a one-time, the administration may feel differently if it were a one-time mm -hmm. investment as opposed to ongoing. So we'll keep this open. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Page 16 is dental disease prevention program. Assembly had a proposal. The Assembly uh, approved funding to restore the dental disease prevention program. This program provided oral health prevention services to underserved children in schools with at least a 50% free or reduced lunch, school lunch eligibility throughout California. The program was suspended in 2009 due to the state's fiscal condition. Ms. Posler. Um, along the lines of my prior comments, uh, this is a program that's outside of our core Medi-Cal program uh, and just do not support additional general fund augmentations that the state can't support over the long run. Uh, do we know how the $3.2 million was determined? I would imagine this also could be considered scalable, but how was the three point two million reached? Uh, that I do not know. Um, I think this was a this was the funding that the program had before it was eliminated before um, and um, and and you know given in two thousand nine we they had a program of this size in the state in our schools with regards to uh, providing um, preventive care for, for children. Often this serves our, our poorest of kids, the most underserved, who may not have um, positive role models at home concerning dental health care. Uh, and this provides in the schools the opportunity to do assessment of kids, uh, to get, teach them uh, positive dental health care, those kinds of things that sometimes we take for granted. 
many communities don't, and they end up um, finding ourselves with large dental bills and other kinds of things as they go on. So it really is uh, one of the more preventive uh, public health issues that we have that really works on oftentimes the uh, uh, children who are the poorest in our, in, our, in our nation in terms of being able to uh, give them some assessment and support uh, to, uh, to improve their dental care uh, when they're young. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, we're going to put this open for now, but I'm very sensitive to the arguments mm -hmm. you make. I've got the number of 500,000 California children mm -hmm. miss school each year for tooth decay, mm -hmm. which is the most prevalent, preventable infection that a child to age 13 can experience. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, children who come to school with a dental disease and infection uh, may have to miss school. If they miss school, they're likely to fall behind. If they fall behind, they may fail. If they fail, they may drop out. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is a serious issue you've ad mm -hmm. addressed here. So, uh, Mr. Martin. Uh, yes, so if this would restore the funding that was previously eliminated, I wanted to note that prior to elimination of the funding, the program operated in 31 counties to serve approximately 300,000 preschool and elementary school children annually. Um, mm -hmm. So it would likely restore those services to that number <coughs> of children in that, roughly that number of school districts. Thank that you. is helpful. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Martin. Colleagues, we have three more pages to complete health, so I think we'll make that our goal, and then we'll mm -hmm. make our way to the floor. Page 17 is Lab Aspire program, along with a microbiologist. <coughs> the proposal here is the assembly. Mr. Martin? The assembly approved funding for the Lab Aspire program and for one state microbiologist, uh, the California Public Health Laboratory Network is made up of uh, state laboratory and 35 local public health laboratories and current regulations require public health lab directors to hold a doctorate degree certification uh, and um, the lab aspire program was created in 2006 to provide educational support for people who want to become public lab directors and again, uh, this was a previously established program i think going back to 2006 that mm -hmm. got cut in 2012. Mm -hmm. yes this um, this program was listed as one of our high one of the highest priorities of our health officers in the state. Um, I think given our recent outbreak in the measles and Ebola, uh, there was great concern that as a state the size that we are that we don't have our own uh, labs to basically respond to the issues quickly enough. Uh, it would also be a program that would uh, basically support and encourage our doctoral students who could possibly participate in these labs and work and. Uh, California, being the size that it is, uh, uh, needs to have its own, uh, according to our health officials, its own labs and its own microbiologists uh, to work on the critical issues we face in terms of infectious diseases. So um, it's a modest proposal when you look at it, a million dollars for a state this size to have its own labs and to really begin to address uh, communicable diseases in California. You make compelling points. We're going to keep this open for now. Page 18 is hepatitis C rapid testing kits, and this is a Senate proposal. Yes, the Senate approved funding to purchase an estimated 33,000 HCV rapid testing kits at a cost of 600,000. So the idea here being that we could benefit from the state's bulk purchasing power? I believe so. As opposed to the status quo? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are about 750,000 Californians currently living with HCV, but as I mentioned earlier, about half, if not more, don't even know it. Uh, how would the kits be distributed if we were to move forward with this? So, so the state would purchase, benefit from our bulk purchasing, and then we'd need to get these to the counties? So I believe the, the Office of AIDS um, the adult viral hepatitis coordinator housed in the STD branch to determine the best method to disseminate the test kits to community-based programs that have a, a focus on serving low-income communities. Finance? You got a thought? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> there's also a proposal not unlike this for uh, bulk purchasing of needles. Yes. Right. Okay. So again, also to mm -hmm. be kept open. And that was just six hundred thousand dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. Page nineteen. Prep access and outreach. The Senate uh, approved funding for the PrEP Access and Outreach Program. This program would provide funding for outreach to individuals at risk for, for HIV and provide education about PrEP, including information on how to access PrEP. The Assembly approved funding for the PrEP Access and Outreach Program. Um, it's just a difference in the amount of dollars of 800000 general fund. So our trailer bill language is the same. It's really just the difference between the 2.2 and $3 million. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. I think we can reach an agreement. Yeah. We will find our difference, I'm sure, soon. <laughs> Though not today. And on page 20, the last issue we'll take up at this time is licensing and certification timelines. So the Senate approved the proposed positions and expenditure authority uh, regarding licensing, the administration's licensing and certification proposals, and adopted trailer bill language to establish 90 day time frames to complete complaint investigations at long term care facilities and to require DPH to notify hospitals if a complaint investigation would not be completed in a timely manner due to extenuated circumstances. The assembly adopted a 45 day time frame instead of a 90 day time frame. So the difference is the time frame in the trailer bill language. Ms. Bosley. Yeah, we, we had a major proposal in January that we appreciate all the oversight and the subcommittees um, taking a hard look at it. I think that 45 day timeline is of um, grave concern to us given the staffing resources that are being approved here. Um, we do think that the 90 day uh, uh, target is something that, uh, that the department could live within. Uh, and so we're, we're um, okay with the Senate language, we support the Senate language. One of our concerns, and, and, and you can let us know if this is um, possible, uh, we believe at some point, one of our concerns is that um, as we, as you talk about the 90 day time frame, uh, if they don't meet the 90 days, then they can get an extension uh, for another 90 days, my understanding. Is that correct? Yes, under the um, proposed language, there would be an extension under extenuating circumstances in which they would have to explain um, why that would be the case. So basically a half a year. With extenuating circumstances. Right. So our concern is that, you know, we may end up with, uh, in many of these cases, uh, <clears throat> dealing with licensing and, and long-term care and the complaints and investigations that too often by the time the investigation is had and determined the person is dead. And that's a great concern in these facilities where you have complaints. So, so, uh, yeah. um, so we looked at the 40 day, 45 days as reasonable. We might be willing to negotiate between 45 and 90, but surely not with, um, even though people tell you extenuating circumstances, we know what that means up here. Uh, almost every circumstance is extenuating to a certain extent. And so as a result, we end up with these long delays of investigation into these facilities. Uh, we're increasing the staffing, I understand. Um, for what, 237 people? Uh, so we're increasing staffing. We ought to be able to increase the response time as well. I mean, in, in a significant way that uh, people believe that we are truly uh, adequately evaluating and, and dealing with the problem. So the licensing and certification proposal is really, um, uh, it's, it's a comprehensive proposal and there are many tiers um, of, um, of emergency response that um, are implicit in it. Uh, for any kind of threat to immediate danger or death of a patient, public health is actually um, arrives on site within 24 hours of that event. Uh, and the department must initiate its investigation on the most serious complaints, so a different category than the one I just talked about, the serious complaints within the 10 day period. So there are a lot of safeguards for the most serious complaints. As you can imagine with a system as large as we have in California, these are all um, of the long term care facilities. Uh, there, there does have to be some sorting and prioritizing um, in order to get the work done. And so uh, 
there is absolutely no intent to uh, put off complaints for six months, uh, but every day the managers uh, at the Department of Public Health are really going to have to be prioritizing workload and making sure that the most serious um, uh, uh, complaints um, are addressed and that workload is appropriately managed in order to cover all of them within the 90 days. Do we actually have about 4,000 Mm -hmm. Backlogged investigations right now. There, are, yes, there are a number of um, um, older cases that the resources proposed in the January 10 proposal would help um, work through. Um, we'd also note to the notion of timeframes. Then there's no completion timeframe now, so even having the 90 days is beyond what we have in statute now as far as completing investigations. So that's. Um, that would be a new requirement for the department, and as it is now, they are not meeting um, the 90 days for all of their, their complaint cases. They're only about 70% of the way there, and we're hoping with those 200 plus positions that we can get to the 90 days. So just noting that the 90 days is a new requirement in itself. There's no completion time frame currently. Let me argue on behalf of the assembly a proposal for a second. If we were to go to 45 days with extenuating circumstances, would there be any harm? So Ms. Bosler said it would be too tight, too constraining. But again, if there are extenuating circumstances, might this, in light of 4,000 backlogged <laughs> investigations, be a bit of a lit fire? It would, um, it, would, it would be a lit fire, but the problem is having enough staff to actually address that and make that time frame. The 200 plus positions we proposed will take a pretty significant hiring effort alone. There are currently about um, a little under 1,100 positions in that division. So this is a pretty big proposal that we're putting forward. And, and hiring all those folks will be an effort in itself. So a training period of around Training 18 period, months. 12 to 18 months. That's part of the ramp up. We have a phase in proposal for 15, 16 for the 200 plus positions. Um, so, you know, implementation, implementation time frame, number of days that is reasonable and doable within um, the staffing resources that are proposed is it, okay. 90 days will be an effort. Uh, and so let me ask you a question. Once you ramp up, what do you consider to be a reasonable amount of time? In other words, you're ramping up now. Hopefully you're going to get this backlog taken care of mm -hmm. because we're having all these one-time people being hired, 237 positions. What is a reasonable time that one should expect that a normal investigation would occur? Um, I don't have like an average number of days that an investigation takes. We do know that about 70% of the long-term um, investigations um, are addressed within 90 days. Some of them are beyond 90 days and take longer than that. And that's something that public health has been reporting on on a quarterly basis, kind of their performance metrics, which is a new requirement from last year. So I don't know what um, an average number of days, appropriate number of days is, because I think the complaints vary from, you know, not too serious to quite serious. And so I don't have a, a day um, time frame to give you on that one. You could, under, you, I assume you could understand why that is problematic when you don't really believe that there is a, or maybe you do, where you're not, not really saying that there is a, a reasonable amount of time given a normal, and, and even though no situation is ever normal, but given an investigation, most folks will say it generally takes this long for us to complete that investigation. Under extenuating circumstances, we might have to double that time. But there ought to be some what we consider to be a reasonable amount of time because not having that ends up with us with 4,000 as a backlog. I mean, without believing that there's a, a time frame that people ought to be able to get some response uh, from the agency concerning complaints. And as a little bit of history, the backlog is also stemming from just not sufficient resources being at the department. We've had um, quite the turnaround and estimate methodology this year, which has helped kind of identify the 200 plus need that we're putting forward. So this is a division that's, you know, having to, um, the 200 positions just to kind of meet the workload as required now. Um, so the 90 days, again, it'll be, it'll be um, uh, difficult to, to meet, but they are committed to meeting that with the proposed resources that they have. Well, um, the reason why I'm asking, I understand that the past situation where we uh, resources were eliminated, and so therefore we end up with the backlog. Uh, we add additional resources to begin to ramp up and to deal with the issue of the backlog. Uh, once we get past that, that's what I'm saying. One, even if we delay the 45 days or 40 to 90, somewhere in between that, to after full uh, training, development, backlog stuff, I'm just asking what would be, if you're at full capacity, that you believe that you should be as an agency, what is a reasonable amount of time that one should expect 
a, uh, an, a complaint, to, an investigation to occur. And I don't have a, a set number of days that that would, that would be. I think because the division's been struggling so much and their, their performance metrics show that they're not even at the 90 days, I don't know what that number is. Do we have any historical documentation mm -hmm. before, the, before the economic downturn, what people consider to be a reasonable amount of time? I could go back to the department and ask. I don't have that, that on, would be helpful. on hand. That would be helpful. Thank you. I want to back up Assemblywoman mm -hmm. Weber on this. It would seem to me, and again, we're all so pleased that mm -hmm. you're proposing this kind of investment in additional staff because the need is great. But it would seem to me, and tell me otherwise, that you've landed on 237 mm -hmm. and not 238 or 236 <laughs> for a reason. You've thought this out. You've determined what your need is. But once fully implemented, I think you'd have in your sights an average time for investigating a complaint. And if you haven't, I'd suggest you do. Because, and otherwise, maybe we're shooting too low. And it shouldn't be 237, it should be 337. Because, in fact, I should back up a little bit. What's your goal? You should have a goal and then work backwards from mm -hmm. there as to how much staff you need to hit that goal. Mm -hmm. So I know we're not going to yeah. resolve this today, but I think we need to mm -hmm. all agree collectively mm -hmm. as to what is a reasonable time frame. In, when we have vulnerable people in our institutions and we know that there are problems within them and there are complaints, yeah, we want to get these things done, mm -hmm. if not 45 days, maybe it's 60 days. And if it's not 60 days, maybe it's 90. And maybe we can set the goal for 90 once you're fully implemented. And then maybe by 2018, we want to get to 60. Right. But we need to have some kind of time frame. <coughs> Senator Nielsen. I would uh, echo the sentiments of the vice chair and the chair on this. Uh, the, the point being, we, we don't really know. And this is a situation that is not unique. It's endemic and historic in every agency. And we have something that I call, uh, you, you, you have a numbers chase. Uh, every year the agencies come in and they have a backlog. And they need more PYs. And every year they come back the next year. And, well, we need more PYs. Why? Because of the backlog. And this tracking of historical performance uh, and accountability is really something important. And this could be a significant step that would help us with all agencies. So I certainly endorse the approach of the chair and the vice chair. And, uh, and I'm very impassionate about it because it's such a long-standing thing, and it's always more PYs. I always say, no, maybe we need to cut the PYs, and then you would start getting to work and do the job. Thank you, Senator Nielsen. Senator Laura. Nope, we're all set. We're going to keep this open. We've made it through our first reading of health, and we're going to come back at 2 o'clock to set a goal of doing the same with human services. So we'll see you at 2.